Hello, my fellow front-end developers. My name is David Janiga, and I have a pleasure to be your host today. On today's NetGuru Hangout, the front-end universe, we'll go through the journey for the, from the entire front-end universe. Our first speaker will be Kasper Wojciechowski. But first, I would like you to introduce to NetGuru's culture exactly how we deal with the front-end. Uh, we are the team of strong 90 front-end developers. And I don't want to talk with you about some you know, marketing jargon or some marketing stuff, but instead I would like you to show the grassroots initiatives or which came also from Casper and also from me as a front-end developer inside NetGuru, uh, which uh, takes us to the journey of having the front-end architecture area and also front-end digest. And both of them are initiatives created by us as the developers. And in our usual working time, we meet on a regular basis on Friday on front-end architecture area to speak about React, Angular, Svelte view, and any other things. Also, how to talk with the business or how to plan the refactor. Should we go in the way to speak with the business, how to make something I guess the application from scratch, or should we talk with our customers about how to implement new things? And all of those, all of those small topics uh, can be combined in one area, as I mentioned, uh, the architecture, uh, to leverage our knowledge from many projects and also to learn more from each other. And this is something which we can make on a regular basis on our regular working hours. And despite of that, uh, I have a pleasure to learn a lot from Katzper because uh, months ago, I subscribed to newsletters, many of them, JavaScript Weekly, CSS Weekly, uh, Node Weekly, and so on. Uh, but instead of subscribing and checking by myself what is going on inside the front-end universe, I have a chance to read Katzper front-end digest, which is uh, our internal newsletter sent uh, by Katzper on a regular basis, uh, sometimes weekly, sometimes biweekly, depends on the how many changes in our world uh, already done. And the most important fact is that I don't have to spend my time as a developer to learn about new stuff. And because of that, uh, I just would like to say, uh, to say thank you to Katzper because uh, he made really great job to show what is going on inside our world. And now, Kasper, please welcome. The stage is yours. Hello. Uh, OK, I will share my screen. Um, hello, my name is Kasper, and I will be guiding uh, today's travel to the front end universe. Thank you, David, for the, intro for the great introduction. Um, and let's start. Let's start. So, uh, what uh, we will talk uh, about today, we will talk about the history, about how the front-end look, looked like in the past and how the websites are looking now. Uh, we, are, we will talk about the interesting bits from the front-end universe and we will talk about the comfort zone that we, we sometimes uh, uh, stay in, which is bad, a, a bad thing. So, yeah. Um, I, the, the whole presentation is full of QR codes. So if you have phone laying around, so please prepare it because you can scan the QR codes to learn more about libraries or different articles that I will talk about here. So uh, to know how the front end has involved, we need to go back in time. Uh, we need to go back to year 1983. To to see how front-end has involved. OK, so uh, this, this, not, this is not the website that you uh, to, to see like in your browser. Uh, this is Terminal. Web, websites in the past, in, in that year, uh, was only accessible from uh, Terminal. And this uh, on, on the screen is the first uh, website in the world, as given by various websites about worldwide web history. At this time, websites were uh, 
used only for sharing information between scientists around the world, nothing fancy. So let's go back to modern times. Okay, today websites are not only for sharing information. We have websites that allow you to buy stuff online, rent a house or flat, design our, our kitchen, or schedule an appointment with the doctor. Websites have animations, 3D elements, or interactive elements. The growth of the front end in general is enormous. But the question is, what can we call front end today? Front end today is not only the text on the page, images, or styles. It's the whole universe that we seem to call. It. The front end is not only text, but also game engines, design systems, desktop apps, UI frameworks, mobile apps, bundlers, 3D elements, and developer tools. Websites are not only for passing information between users or uh, between uh, companies. We have so much things that uh, are available in, in our universe that, uh, that are available with just one click. For example, we have a library that is called Remotion that allows you to, um, to create videos uh, by using your React components. It's pretty neat. You can go and scan this QR code and it will be, it, it should open your, your uh, uh, GitHub page with that library. We have also a Doom Capture, which is very fun and awesome library that replaces the standard uh, Google Captcha widget on your web page with the uh, Doom uh, mini game where you need to uh, kill monsters to uh, go through the page. We have also, for example, uh, projects uh, like Bruno Simon's uh, portfolio, where you can drive around the map with a 3D car. That um, in, and in that map, you can discover things like projects that Bruno has done. And we have, for example, Nuxt Hill, which is a very crazy project that will toggle your uh, smart light in your house depending on the status of your local build. So if, you're, if, you, um, if your build is falling, it's, it's, if your local build is fall, falling, the light will turn red. But if it's, it's everything right, the light will back to uh, green. So it's mind blowing for me. Um, as you know, uh, we, uh, as front-end developers, we sometimes want to have fun. So uh, not only um, uh, games are created by uh, Unity or Unreal Engine, Engine uh, are available for us in browsers. We can also uh, create browser, uh, game browsers, uh, yeah, games in browser by using uh, front-end technologies. For example, we have Phaser uh, library that is the most popular and widely used to create games. We have Excalibur, which is TypeScript first, and it's focused on developer experience. We have Gute and Kaboom, which are the small, smallest libraries, but very powerful. And I really strongly recommend you to check, it, check them out. So this is only the the tip of the iceberg in the front-end universe. We can find more alternatives, but it's very important to get out of your library's comfort zone. You may ask, what's that? The library's comfort zone, it's when you use only one library for everything. There is no other library that you want to use. You use only one library for everything. And, when, and library's comfort zone is when you denying using new library. For example, you talk with your friend and uh, he or she says that um, they um, learn about new library, but you say, no, no, I have that one library and it's okay. It's not good to stay in that comfort zone because we do not learn no new things and no uh, ways to solve our problems. So please keep in mind that uh, alternatives that will be presented in the next slides does not mean that uh, our 
are bad or should be avoided. The point of showing alternatives is, is to expand your horizons and to know other approaches to your well-known solutions. Please also remember that the choosing library for a project should be preceded by research. So let's start with uh, alternatives for React, Vue, or Angular. We have React, Svelte, Solid, JS, and here yeah, lead element elements, lead element libraries. But before we are going to uh, show the differences be between them, we need to. I need to show you one, two small graphs about uh, libraries in the frontend universe. So we have that uh, that graph here is uh, usage ratio ranking from the state of JS survey, which uh, every front end developer or no can take a part of it. So as you can see, we have three main libraries that are very popular in terms of usage, React, Angular, and Vue.js. But this uh, graph will drastically change if we present here the satisfaction of using libraries. The satisfaction ratio ranking as presented here is very different from the usage in the market. As you can see, uh, libraries like Svelte and Alpine will are gaining the popularity of, uh, of the front-end universe. So um, it's good sign that we have options to solve our problems. OK, enough of data. Let's move to the code. And let's, let's start with uh, uh, Preact. Preact is alternative to React, if you don't know. Um, it, uh, it's very small. It has only three kilobytes in size and has the same modern API like Re React, but it's smaller. We have Svelte, like I mentioned before, is the most loved web framework in the front-end universe, in Stack Overflow survey or in the um, state of JS survey. So let's take a look at Svelte's code. Svelte's code is pretty similar to Vue, but with some differences. For example, as you can see, we have different uh, directives or different script tag, but I think it's very easy going. So yeah, I recommend you to try it out later. Solid.js, another library that is great alternative for React Vue or Angular. Uh, it's performance focused framework. As for today, it's the fastest framework in the front end universe. Also, does not have virtual DOM, so there is no additional layer between your framework and browser to display the data or update the GIFs, patterns, and so on. Let's take a look at SolidJS code. As you can see, the code, as, as, at first glance, there is a similarity uh, to React. But when taking a closer look, you can see that the uh, render function here runs only once. There's a big advantages of that in the performance. Very interesting. We have lead element, last but not least on that list. Um, tries to be, as much as possible, easy for developers to create web components. Let's take a look at the code. We have uh, classes, um, and we have the curators. It's uh, pretty complex, but I think it's pretty uh, great for, for specific uses. So many things you may say, and, and you might be right. A bit overwhelming? I don't think so. So don't worry. I have a, another list for you. This time is the list of alternatives for Redux. Um, are you bored of using it? Next time, consider using, for example, React Query, which is a very powerful library of React hooks for fetching and caching data without touching any global state. XState, very neat library for defining finite state machines and state charts. And we have, for example, Recoil, another library, this time from Facebook, like, like React, that lets you define your state by using atoms. So let's start with React Query. React Query is very uh, popular now. Helps you to not bother by things like caching, fetching, and sharing global data. So let's take a look at the code. This is a standard React component, which fetches data from the external resource. As you can see, all logic related to fetching, caching, and deriving status of request is encapsulated in this small hook. Pretty neat, if you ask me. We have XState. It's very complex, but 
It's very powerful. Great library if you want to define a finite state machine for your project or a single feature. Let's you define a finite number of action and flows that may happen during user interactions. Here's a sample code from XState documentation. To get started with XState, we need to define um, a state machine where we can define initial state and flows between states. Then we can start that machine. And in, for, for that example, we are constantly logging each transition between uh, various states. To, to move to another state or to change the state of the uh, machine, we need to send an action to that, uh, to that machine. Uh, this, uh, in this example, we are sending toggle action, which, is, which uh, moves uh, our state to active state, as you can see in cons console. Then if we send another uh, toggle action, uh, our machine uh, translates to inactive state. It's pretty complex, but if you, get, uh, if you know it better, it's very powerful and I really recommend it. Another great library, as I mentioned before, is Recoil. Recoil is created by developers from Facebook. It lets you define your state by using atoms. There is nothing like one state to rule all components. So to get started with Recoil, it's very, very easy. This code is from Recoil's documentation. So the first thing that you want to do is to define your state by using Atom. Atom, uh, value of Atom can be whenever you like, a string, number, object, or array. We need to also assign a key for recognizing that Atom. Then we can use various hooks to modify or select data from your Atom. For me, it's very, very interesting. I didn't have enough space to put all alternatives for Redux, but here's a quick list of alternatives, smaller alternatives that were, that's worth to mention. For example, we have Jotai, which is a scalable, scalable library, which allows you to use atoms when defining your state, like recoil from previous slide. We have Zustand, which store uh, which is small, fast, and scalable state management library, which uses simplified flux principles. We have React Switch State, which is very similar to Redux Toolkit Slice, but smaller. And yeah, and we have Valtio, which takes your JavaScript proxy and puts it at, as a state. And of course, this is only the tip of the iceberg, so there's a lot more libraries that need to be discovered. So are you feeling overwhelmed? Don't be. I have another list for uh, alternatives for style components. Uh, and let's discuss them. We have Emotion, Linaria, Vanilla Extract, and for example, Stitches as an alternative for style components. Let's start with Emotion. Emotion has similar API, and the core of the Emotion is framework agnostic. As you can see, here's a sample code. Um, for emotion, and emotion lets you define uh, styles that will be assigned to a class name during uh, runtime, and that class name can be used anywhere um, you want. Here is an example of emotion with React. Here's a special special pa package for that. Has nearly identical uh, syntax as style components. The uh, the differences are a bit deeper in the code in what most advanced used. Let's move to uh, let's move to another li library, which is Linaria. Very great library from Polish uh, company, which allows you to just like style components, style your uh, style your application. Framework agnostic version looks like pretty much uh, like Emotion, which allows you to define a class which it's important, which will be transpiled during build time. So this is a very performant way to create uh, styles for your uh, for your application. Then the, then we can use that class name whenever we want. Okay, this is the uh, Linaria React version. As you can see, there is no difference between uh, emotion style components and Linaria. When using when React when when using with React, so yeah, pretty awesome if you ask me. Okay, 
Mm. Last but not least, we have other alternative short time style components, of course. We have Stitches. They recently published first production ver ready version. It's also framework agnostic and it's very similar to Linaria. Allows you to define style components that will be compiled in build time to nearly zero runtime, like Linaria I mentioned before. We have also Vanilla Extract, which is a great TypeScript oriented library for abstracting your CSS variables. And of course, as I mentioned before, this is only the tip of the iceberg. The front end universe is full of these libraries. So, are you feeling overwhelmed now? Remember, in the front end universe, there are a lot more great libraries that are ready to be discovered. <laughs> Have you taken a deep breath? Don't worry, I won't show any more alternatives. But you may ask now how to be up to date without being overwhelmed. The simplest and easiest way is to let others do the job for you. But in form, for example, newsletter, you can subscribe to a newsletter like David mentioned in the introduction. You can subscribe to internal newsletter like Frontend Digest or the external newsletters like JavaScript Weekly or CSS Weekly. Another way to stay on track is to read developer blogs, like these published on Dev2 platform, for example. And you can always attend to various web-related events, like this one. When learning about new library architecture process, write it down in post of form, uh, in, in form, in, sorry, in form of post or Slack message. It's, it's the easiest way to learn and share your knowledge with others. Maybe start your own newsletter like Frontend Digest. But if you just not feel up to it, there are great people out there sharing their own, own knowledge and opinions that are a great place for it. And the great place for it is Twitter. In no particular order, I recommend following, for example, Dan Abramov, which is the creator of the overreacted blog, and of course, React and React Redux contribution. We have Ivan Yo, which is the creator, the creator and project lead of Vue and Vita projects. We have Sophie Alpert, which, which writes and speaks about open source projects. We have, we have Ken C. Dots. I think it's uh, he is the most popular person here, uh, the creator of Testing Library, an excellent uh, and has excellent blog about code quality. We have, of course, Adi Osmani, which is an, an engineering manager at Google Chrome and the author of JavaScript Design Pattern book. We have, of course, uh, worth to mention, Eric Elliott, the author of the programming JavaScript application book named by community as JavaScript Guru. But these are people that are recognized, but you may find people in your company that have strong uh, experience like David to ask uh, things regarding uh, architecture or libraries or in general experience in IT and front-end world. So it's good to uh, ask and share your knowledge with others. Maybe you can start your own blog to share your knowledge and uh, speak speak to the world. But the most important thing in the whole presentation is in case you have missed a release of a popular library or you don't feel that following everything mentioned today is for you, keep call and don't worry. Eventually, you will find that information or will, you will hear about it from someone. Okay, learning, uh, we, we have learned today about so much libraries. So you may ask, what are the benefits of staying uh, up to date and knowing these libraries? So being up to date is very valuable. It opens your eyes for new solutions and approaches. First of all, knowing that there are a lot of possibilities and solutions for of a single task, you will start thinking out of the box. Your code base and project will improve. Your client or employer will be surprised about your, the variety of tools you know. 
Like I said before, you will learn new solutions and approaches for different problems that you will help you that will help you resolve any issues in a daily job. And of course, you will have more topics to discuss with your friends. Last but not least, it's fun. It's it's very fun to experiment with technologies or framework that you can use in your daily job because as I mentioned before, React and Angular and uh, Vue.js are the most popular and have the most usage on the market. So as for closing words, I have an interesting fact to emphasize the fact that the frontend is almost for everything. This entire presentation is made by using frontend technologies. I've used a library called SlideDev for that, to show you that this is uh, code from uh, this is uh, uh, this, this slides are uh, coded in code. As you can see, this is a code that uh, is this slide is uh, coded like that. You can uh, mix Markdown. You can use uh, view components and so on, and you can export this whole presentation to PDF format or host it on your service. Thank you for staying with me. Remember. Our journey in the front end universe never ends. David, I think the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kacper. Uh, that was a great presentation. I really admire your job, especially the thing that uh, you spent a lot of hours to gather all of those newsletters and blogs you mentioned and just give us a pill, you know, as the pill of knowledge. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I think that the entire NetGuru front end team uh, can sign the same, the same thing. They can say the same thing. And now we'll start the next part, uh, which will be the inspiration rather than strictly connected with the some specific interface or some specific library in the front end. Uh, give me a sec to briefly show you what is going on here. I have a plenty of plenty of devices here and would like to show you the entire universe of interfaces. And now you should see my screen. Okay. I'm also reading the comments so we can interact or asking the questions, which will be later. Uh, answered but meanwhile if you would like to dig more about some topics uh, feel free uh, there are a few of us uh, from netguru to combine our experience to make the best possible experience and i will start with a simple question uh, can you see my hand in the right side of the window i need to start to have some confirmation so, so we are sure that all the devices are visible and you can see everything i would like to share with you based on the front end universe you can, uh, okay, it's Vidac, it's yes, great. Okay, so, it, so the introduction is, this is my DJ console. This is something I made after hours as the, you know, hobbies DJ. Uh, this is exactly a native, native instrument Traktor S8. And I usually use that as the sound device like, you know, to play uh, four channels of music and to play some sets or, you know, mixing, mixing some, some, uh, some, fan some fan fancy songs. But despite of, you know, having the DJ control, we can, we can use that as the device connected via USB. And the interesting part is that you can control input and output of this device in your browser. And first, I would like to show you uh, the exact solution for the problem of having the dark room as I have right now. So please bear with me and look closely. Here, there are three faders, C, A, and B. And you can see there is something in my background. The first one, Bing, second, and third. 
Okay, it's a little brighter, but we have also the knobs. The exact knob, low pass, is usually used for having a mix or making the exact mix of two songs. But now we can control the exact knob in JavaScript and tell, for example, that we want to change the hue. And I would like to change the hue for all light bulbs. So as you can see, my background changed to the reddish one. And the great thing about those knobs is that every button you can see on this device can be controlled via JavaScript in your browser without additional plugins or additional, I don't know, even you know, drivers or some kind of stuff. It's uh, currently supported, not by, unfortunately, all browsers, but uh, it's good enough to use that at least as the fancy project or maybe something which might be used uh, by your customer if this is the you know, business case. But the most important part is that the thing you saw on the camera is based on the MIDI instruments. And that means that you don't have to buy additional keyboard or additional devices to control, for example, lighting in your room. You can use, uh, for example, native instruments machine like this one or any keyboard connected with your computer via USB cable. And that means that every device which is supported via MIDI, which means musical instruments digital interface in long, can be supported also in JavaScript. And what about the name of this interface? It's called as you can guess, Web MIDI. And the great thing about Web MIDI is that it's not the new or you know a hard to understand interface. It's already you know, installed on many operating systems. But the important part is that you can access MIDI devices directly from your browser. And based on that, we can, for example, gather the input from this slider as just regular JavaScript event, like key down or mouse up and so on. And based on that, you can also build something which output, for example, the sound from the browser. Everything you have to know about WebPD is that it's not as easy to play with it as we would like to as the developers. So uh, it's the same like with WebGL. If you know WebGL, it's a pretty complex stuff, so usually we use something like FreeJS or Babylon. And it's the same with WebMIDI. Of course, uh, you know, it's, it's great to know in the details how WebMIDI works, but it's even more important to know how you can make your job easier by using, for example, WebMIDI.js. It's the wrapper library built on top of WebMIDI like the same as the FreeJS on WebGL. And the most hard or the, the hardest parts are implemented inside the library. So for example, if you would like to just use your keyboard because you have the one, for example, or you, you know, your, your brother or sister have one uh, in the next room, you can play with the same device uh, connected with the USB. And this is the line responsible for accessing this device in the browser. There are a few gotchas. The first one is about secure connection. Uh, the website has to be hosted via HTTPS or can be hosted on localhost. And the second thing about connecting with uh, any device like MIDI is the security concerns. And because of that, a few topics on Mozilla, Firefox, and Safari uh, were rejected you know, as the support. Uh, so I don't want to lie with you that the support is great. It's not bad, I can say, since uh, the relative usage, as you can see, it's around three out of four users in the web can use web MIDI. But of course, if you use that as the current aligned, you can see many red columns. So you have to choose carefully, especially as the designer of the app or, you know, uh, especially as the architect, that the business case might be based only on Chrome since, as you can see, the Chrome also on mobile can use the web MIDI. You can play with your phone to have additional sequencer or sampler to play in the music. 
Uh, so it's not, I can say, production ready to any application, uh, but at least you can use that for creating some fancy controlled apps from the perspective of the device. But the most important is that it's only the device. So it means that from perspective of the application, it's just the same application you would like you want to build in, for example, in React. And now I would like to show you the code which is responsible for building this app. I will start from index as usual. On the left side, you can see the representation of the light bulbs. The idea is to show you that the opacity of these circles is strictly connected with the brightness. And now we can ask ourselves how we can build something which makes this light in my background and also change something in the browser in the real time, especially from, you know, output device like this one, like Tractor S8. And I have to admit that it's not hard. It's not hard at all, since if you look closely to the event sent to the browser from S8, you can see And please confirm that uh, the, my console is big enough so you can read the events in the console. On private chat or comments. Can't wait, can't wait for an answer. Should I make it bigger? Okay, thank you, Maciek. So, the main idea here about showing you the exact message sent from device to the browser is that if you look closely, we have array here, array of three elements. The first one and the second one is kind of ID. It depends on the manufacturer of the device, but we can assume as the developers that we can combine the first two items in the array and create ID. And the exact thing is made in the app. So as you can see, we'll choose the first slider, it's C. I will move a little bit the slider so we can see two events. First item, one, seven, eight, six, nine. One, seven, eight, six, nine. And it's called by me as the developer in the application, slider C. I've also added the max value, so we are sure that we are not above or under the limit of this slider. And based on this ID created by us and sent, of course, to us from the device, we can also get the third value from the array, which is value. So as you can see now, we have zero. And uh, I guess you see also that in the background. And now we have the full opacity in the browser and also full brightness in the Philips Hue lights in my in my back. So how we can implement, you know, having any slider or even knob. Now you can see this, but you can see this. Okay. That might be a good one. How about keys? Like this one. It's just the path. I usually use that to play some sample or a hot cue to move around in the song. But if I click or, you know, exactly key down this pad, then one event is sent to browser. And when I mouse up or key up, the second event is sent to the browser. So you as the developer can easily create something which might be really fancy to have uh, some additional modes in your app, like, you know, with clicking the shift, alt or control and so on. And based on that, you can also create additional ID from the first two elements in array and see that we have only two values, the maximum 127 and zero. And it's like, you know, like Boolean, but the MIDI standard says to us that we should use 128 values in sum. So yeah, that, that's great that, you know, every, every part of this console uh, behaves the same. So it's predictable to program the application like that. And I would like to show you additional events so we can see how we can debug and understand that 
it's just the keyboard, but with many more keys inside it. But the events in JavaScript are the same. And it's you know, your imagination or your responsibility as the developer to see the connections between, OK, if I click something in my keyboard, this is the same event as here. And what I can do with that? I can, for example, use some patterns like publish, subscribe to inform my application about the change which was made. But of, of course, I don't want to know, know only the number. So the number here is used to connect the slider or the knob with something meaningful like slider A, slider C, something you know from the exactly something you know uh, from the um, interface, the, the physical one of the device. So I've also, as you can see on the uh, middle of the screen, uh, mid C means that this is mid pass of the C slider. C is here and here. The same is for low pass. It's the exact line. And, this, and the last one is slider. And I use that pattern only to show you that it don't have to be something prepared by the manufacturer, but uh, it can be described by us as the developer, you know, as the, as the developer, uh, to easily create some flow or to handle the event, and how the event is handled at least. So first of all, this is our regular index page. This is created on the next. Via use effect, we attach our web MIDI enable from webmidi.js. And if there is an error, we would like to know about that. If there is any connected or disconnected device, I will refresh the page so we can see about what it was. We also would like to know about that. So as you can see, MIDI device connected, 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 uh, two inputs and two outputs stereo channels, so two of them. And with that, we can also attach listeners. So exactly here, we can see the entire array of attached listeners for 16 channels of MIDI input. I don't want to dig into details of you know sound construction in general, but uh, the signal sent exactly from this device can be divided for every node in music theory. And this is the exact implementation in JavaScript. But what is important for us is that this is the exact name of the device, which is used here via friendly, via friendly method of get input by name. So it's easy to understand you know, what device is connected if you have any, uh, and especially if any and many, because you can also have uh, in the original MIDI web MIDI interface to dig with ID or manufacturer. It's not as easy as, as exactly uh, this implementation. So uh, with web MIDI, it's really easy to grab the exact device and later attach listener. And the exact listener you saw in the, um, in the console is this line, that every event which is sent to us as the control change is locked or mapped to controller. And the important part here is that this device sent to us control change, but that may be the device which send, which sends the exact note, like the keyboard. So you see that note on or note off or pitch bend. So there are, uh, there are events from music uh, theory in general. And it depends. You have to dig how to implement the exact solution you would like to code uh, for the specific device. For me, control change works great. And here is the mapping. That means that from controller map, which is here, I would like to grab the exact controller via this simple mapping. And then if the controller is found, I would like to emit. The event bus is the exact implementation of publish subscribe. And uh, this is the pattern I found really useful in React applications. So we can decouple the logical modules or even the small domains or even the bigger ones, if you want, uh, through the entire app. So they are loosely coupled, which means that in that 
place, I would like only to say to the application that something changed. Of course, I'm using controller name changed, or I can also use the throttle emit. Throttle emit is useful if you want to play with light bulbs, since not every manufacturer uses the real time update of this device. So sometimes you have to pause a little bit, like for 100 milliseconds. So this is useful uh, for the specific use case. Of course, it depends on your use case. I just would like you to show the idea how you can connect this thing, these events with your app. And from now on, this sounds pretty simple since here you're emitting the events. And the question is, OK, so where are the handlers? And the handlers are here. This is the exact implementation of publish subscribe uh, made by me through the last, I guess, one and a half year. Uh, and the main takeaway from here is that you can use directly the imperatively the code to change the light bulb in the background. And here we would like to react or to handle the event of meet C, which is exactly this button and the exact button of mid C is handled like this. We want to get lights from our dependency container and later we would like to change hue on the first light to the value sent to us from this specific knob. What about slider? Slider is exactly that one is handled in the same way. And you immediately see the result. And the entire implementation of changing the brightness of this light bulb, light bulb in the background consists of emitting the correct event and handling that in a way that it's decoupled from lights. And lights is our dependency. And I don't care which company made the lights. I don't only care about having the right interface. And by having the right interface, I mean that change brightness should get light ID and value. But if you would like to know more how it's implemented, we can open the interface and also the implementation. And there's an implementation of Helixu, which I use right now. Those are my light bulbs from Chandrier, the, the, the regular one. Looks like this. You have the max value sent to the light bulbs. You have to calculate the value. Value is the float from 0 to 1. And via private method of update state, you send to your local Philips Hue bridge that this brightness for this specific light bulb should be set to calculated value. And how it looks like? Simple. It should be simple. It's just the regular fetch sent to your endpoint. Your endpoint, of course, is your local network, exactly your Hue, Hue, uh, Hue bridge address. And this is directly taken from Philips Hue documentation. So as you can see, it's straightforward to set in the state of the specific light and how it looks like in the network. It looks like this. So this is why it's throttled, since Philips Hue can't be you know, updated in the real time, but it's fast enough to have really fancy animation, but sometimes uh, there are some errors about DDoSing uh, your, your, your beach. And the second part of this change, or exactly of emitting this control, is okay, so what about the circle in the web browser? And the answer is we use the same event, since the event emitter doesn't care about handlers at all. And that's the main part of the architecture pattern of publish subscribe. So you don't want to be bothered by you know, any of your consumers. You only would like to be bothered by emitting the correct event. And in the HTML circles, I've used the same event of slider C change throttled to update the opacity of the first circle. And X, it looks like this. And this is the exact thing I would like to show you as the decoupling the event from the handler 
and having the only one axis of changes in your app, which means that the axis of change of this feature of having the circles can be easily exchanged to something like 3D. And the only thing I have to change here is to add a new file, HTML circles, for example, to 3D circles or 3D boxes and so on. But the rest will stay the same because we later still handle the same event, but with different implementation. And anything with device or light bulbs have to be changed since the axis of change is separated from each logical domain. And based on that, we can make really fancy results with connecting many interfaces like sounds, 3D, or even additional APIs or something which, would be, which, which can be downloaded in the real time uh, based on those events. And the last part of handling those events is that there is the pattern, the publish subscribe, which uh, connected, which connects, uh, sorry, connects uh, those domains and modules. And the first thing we have to prepare as the developer is the events as the our, we can say, dictionary for the entire app. So we are sure that the correct events are handled. And later, if you see the C, the C section, mid C change, mid C change throttle, this is the exact, this is the exact, uh, the exact place in the physical device. All of those knobs and sliders are handled via these dictionary items. And later we use the really simple pattern of having the use event as the React hook to subscribe to this event bus so we can easily mix the declarative nature of React and imperative nature of creating some commands or to handling some events. So uh, in short, the arrow is first sent to us from the device and later we take the control and we rotate the device, sorry, rotate the arrow of the control because we want to say to our code what to do, not how to do, but exactly what have to be done in, for example, Philips Hue use case, that you want to change saturation of the specific light, or you want to change specific opacity in the specific box. And I think we have covered the entire universe of connecting the dots between this uh, strange device, which is really simple, as you can see. It only depends how you imagine the usage of these interfaces and the connection between Katzper's presentation and mine is that I couldn't know about those interfaces, you know, those ideas without knowledge about those newsletters, about inspir inspiring myself by these newsletters and without having the fuel to your imagination. Thank you very much. I will bright a bit the background and make it a bit cozier. Okay. We'll see in a minute. Hello. So do you have any questions regarding my presentation, Frontend Universe? I will ask them here. OK, Sergius, uh, uh, the, the, this, the, this uh, Ser Sergius uh, question is, what are the main factors which size if the framework library is mature? in your opinion. In my opinion, mm, it depends uh, on the library because the first thing that I do to determine that the 
Ibar is ma ma mature in enough is that I take a look at the GitHub because um, the issues count and the mm, number of the issues and number of pull requests, number of, of uh, stars in the repository is very important factor when deciding which that library is good enough. For example, um, library for handling forms, it's called, I think, uh, React Hook Form, has great contribution because if you create an issue with bug or uh, 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 or a question, the authors of that library will immediately answer you. I think it's last time I created an issue and, ha ha and got uh, an answer in, I think, in two hours. So it's a very good result. Okay, Bartosz uh, is asking, how do you decide between all of these similar alternatives, which one you are going with? So it depends um, uh, basically on the client requirements because sometimes client, for example, wants to create an app strictly with React and we can't do anything with that because clients has the final words. We can suggest uh, by creating uh, like David mentioned before, architecture that uh, suggests uh, different solutions, but client has uh, the final words that we will go with, uh, for example, React or uh, Angular or Vue.js, because if we, uh, if a client wants to, for example, uh, switch teams or switch companies, they uh, want to have solid foundation, foundation for that. But if you are going, for example, with Hobby Project, I will recommend you to try smaller libraries because you will have so much fun with them and you, you can propose or suggest other people to try it, try them, try these libraries. And maybe with uh, this movement, we can uh, have more competitors to React Angular and Vue.js. Do you have any questions uh, regarding front-end universe? I don't see any uh, question here. So I think there is a time for uh, David to take uh, my place on the stage. Yep, and this is the time for questions to me. Uh, about anything, to be to be to be honest, of course, I would be more than happy to to ask uh, uh, to, to answer any questions we've connected with this device or even you know with uh, some other web interfaces, which I'm also interested. In. Sometimes, yes, uh, the, the the exact solution is not created by uh, by me, uh, since there is also the app which can convert your audio from microphone for example on your uh, on your telephone and transform that to the some you know stroboscope or some disco lights uh, but if i would like to you know get some more hands on experience yep i sometimes i'm uh, i use uh, the exact light bulbs uh, to for example having the really nice uh, mix of uh, two songs with the exact color but it's not you know something something uh, production ready, it's rather to, to have to have some fun with uh, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Uh, the, the question is, do you think now it's a good time to learn new libraries that are gaining popularity? I think that was the question uh, sent, uh, sent to Casper, but I can also take care of this one. Uh, in short, yes, since you have the new perspective, new attitude, uh, sometimes maybe it's not, as Casper mentioned, ready to the current project we are working on because of the foundations or you know, some rules um, set, in, set in stone by this company. But definitely uh, by the perspective, I mean that it's good to know that you can make the same or you can resolve the same business case by different method, by different functions. So uh, I would rather treat that as the toolbox and definitely the state of JS might be the good starting point to know 
which might be good solution or good library to for your next fancy project especially svelte it's it's the one of them since it's gained popularity and the satisfaction uh, satisfaction ratio is really high yep you can use dex the compiler controller as the input and you are responsible as the developer to create uh, some sampler or sequencer uh, to play the sounds but the most important thing is that uh, there are already solutions in the web browser to connect any web media device or even your keyboard and uh, the only the only thing you have to prepare uh, is the mapping between your controller and the exact application but if you would like to know more about uh, topic of uh, making the sound with this controller but not with the native instruments uh, software but in the browser uh, we'll be more than happy to also prepare a front-end hangout based on the topic yep definitely uh, the one exact uh, which helped us in the previous project was also connected with publish subscribe but in a way that we use mediator pattern to prepare something like if the one button changes, then we want to also inform other components about this change. So we have something like the tower or exactly the, um, I don't recall the name. This is the aircraft, uh, the aircraft tower to exactly mediate between aircrafts under the airport, sorry, uh, above the airport. And you can use the same uh, the same design pattern also on your React. And based on that later, you might, you might also use publish subscribe or even more important nowadays, uh, the probably something like the repository pattern or API, if you, if you would like to say about uh, the connection between services. And based on that, uh, you can extract the exact repository of, for example, users or products and hide the implementation from the code which you will consume in the React. And the benefits are that it doesn't matter that you use your API internally, or there is the Algolia service, for example, to uh, fetch the results of searching. Uh, the only change is the change of the exact implementation or concrete implementation, and the inf interface uh, will stay the same. And uh, definitely the, the, there is uh, the good, uh, good, good starting point to read me about that. Uh, it's the Gang of Four book from 1994, uh, design patterns and object-oriented objects. Uh, then there is the good, good, good way to understand or you know to, to start uh, using that also in React nowadays. But of course, it might be not needed at all uh, in our application. So it have to we have to be careful with choosing them. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so uh, based on what I read about those values, it depends on the manufacturer. There should be at least, uh, you know, this uh, this range of values, but th that can be also the preset. And by preset, you can change the values sent from the same button, but with different ID number, which means that, for example, if I click the shift on this specific device, then the values are still sent to me as the 0 to 127. But if I click the shift, then the first ID will increment. So in that way, you can have the at least two or three ranges of values sent from the same button. And it depends, of course, on the manufacturer, uh, which, uh, you know, which, which should be implemented in a way of having this, this specific range. But uh, additional keys like shift, uh, pitch band, uh, should be should be uh, also set in the documentation. Hmm, that's a good. Uh, that's a really good question. I'm not sure which one because you know uh, it depends on the on the use case. But definitely, if the use case is the connection between domains or elements in the React app. I would say that this simple publish subscribe or uh, something even simpler like observe or the more complex case, as I mentioned, mediator might be the best to decouple the components and the topic which uh, took place 
um, three years ago, I think, or four years ago, dumb components and smart components. This is something which we can still look for in the React apps. And the main goal is to remove the business logic from the components and treat the components only as the something which have to present or view your business case or you know your business data or even the model and based on that you can look for a really simple and old model view controller which also might be implemented in react and the benefits are that your components are lightweight and the business context or business use case can be even tested via units separately from react because you have something like the policies from domain driven design and this policy means that you have for example something like the rules to see uh, to show the button or to add something to the cart in the e-commerce app and based on that you send the same information to the code but you additionally send also the intention to other developers that the policy means that that will be the condition and based on that condition something will change or not and that the component won't make a decision about what have to be done because this is not the responsibility of the component component should only inform us via props or even bus or you know this kind of public subscribe implementations that something changed or something happened but not decide about what have to be done because the first thing which we will encounter to reuse the business logic from the specific component might be the nail in the coffin to you know, have this component extracted or even copied to the new one with slightly changed name because you can't reuse the exact the, the exact same business logic from the component so uh, i would say yeah the, this one publish subscribe starting for starting from scratch or from the from the really simple implementation and later uh, looking for the complex implementation maybe also based on domain driven design since you can also have the exact domains in your react app and the connection between between them might also be made by even bus Oh, and one thing, uh, it don't have to be connected with any strict state manager at all, like, you know, Redux, React Suite State, Sustant, and so on, or even, you know, React Query. It don't have to be because the patterns don't care about the implementations. So it's uh, up to your project. Uh, and this design pattern is only about connect connecting those domains. Okay, it looks like that all questions are answered. If yes, Casper, uh, please come come to the stage to the last uh, to the last few words. I don't know what to say. Uh, thank you, David, uh, for uh, uh, hosting this uh, presentation, and thank you all for the awesome questions and for your time today. The same from my side. Uh, thank you, Casper, for a great presentation and for this journey through front-end universe. And also to you guys, to the entire audience that you spent time with us around one hour and 10 minutes. And of course, the great thanks to Justyna and Christian uh, who helped us to make this event happen. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.